a lot of folks ask for resources. Um, this is a really good book, Natural Remedies Encyclopedia. Most folks have this one by um, Dr. Harold Cherney. Who knows Cherney? Anybody know Cherney? Cherney was an amazing guy. He was triple board certified. He was a surgeon, emergency medicine, and family practice. Uh, the last place he practiced was at Eden Valley. Prior to that, he was in Chattanooga. And prior to that, he was up in Shenandoah. When his boys were at SVA, he was uh, there. When they went to SMC, when Mary Lou and I were at SMC, his boys were there and he was, he was practicing in Chattanooga. Then when the boys graduated, he went out to Eden Valley. And, and uh, Vance Farrell, excellent book. How many of y'all have this book? Dr. Agatha finished this one, but it wasn't printed until after she died. Uh, but it's a really good resource. Uh, I always enjoy Dr. Agatha's information. I miss her a lot. Uh, uh, to be able to just ring her up and say, you know, I have an issue here. Um, I remember one of the first times I called her when I went to one of the lifestyle centers. I got there and um, they were only serving breakfast and dinner, dinner being the new meal. And I told them, went in and told the docs, I said, you've got to serve breakfast, dinner, supper, a mid-morning snack, an HS, I mean, afternoon snack, and an HS snack. And they decided to play with me, and they said, um, why? I said, it's the standard of practice. It's what the American Dietetic, Diet, Dietetic Association recommends. And then they asked me one more question. They said, um, how many diabetics did you reverse where you came from? And it had been 20 years I'd worked in healthcare. Zero. Not one. And there we had over a 98% reversal rate of type 2 diabetes. You know, proofs in the pudding, that wasn't enough for me. So I go back to the office, call Dr. Agatha. Dr. Agatha, they're only serving breakfast and dinner. I know they have good outcomes, but is this harmful? She, she just laughed. She says, that's how you reverse diabetes. She says, you extend the fast, break fast. Bre instead of supper to breakfast, do it from dinner to breakfast. And it was many phone calls like that as I was, you know, transitioning and learning uh, lifestyle. I'd call her up and uh, she'd just chuckle and laugh and or we'd go places and, and, and she'd share with me. Another good book is this one. It's the PDR. A lot of folks are familiar with the Physician's Desk Reference. And this one's the Physician, Physician's Desk Reference for Herbal Medicine. It's an excellent book. Uh, same kind of science behind it as you would on the pharmaceutical side. But it tells you dosing. It tells you uh, contraindications. Uh, it's an excellent tool if you have questions. Um, it's a little on the conservative side, not very aggressive, but that's okay. That's okay. Um, and let me do this before I forget. We have a how-to class coming up, and it will be July 27. Take one of these with you. And uh, it'll be Thursday, July 27 at 6 p.m. at the church. How to save tomato seeds and maximize their care. Um, and that will be um, uh, Mr. Ashlock. And boy, that's his specialty, tomatoes. He loves tomatoes. And I was talking to him yesterday. And uh, the goal is to look at how to, how to save seeds, how to take care of the tomato plants to maximize tomatoes. And then he's going to try doing a tomato testing, not a contest, but a tomato testing. Tasting, I'm sorry, a tomato tasting. And so bring your maters, and we'll see uh, what maters you like by different brands, or different, I mean, different varieties. And then, uh, then we're having some mater sandwiches. <laughs> yes. And so uh, y'all can enjoy the tomatoes. And these, I'll talk about these later. All right. So today I'd like to talk about some things you got in the kitchen that you can address health issues. The most important, um, a little over a month ago, Mary Lou and I went back down to UAB, and um, she had had, as y'all know, she had had some issues cardiac-wise uh, two and a half years ago. Her ejection fraction was, a, was very low. Uh, it's come back up decent. Not where I want it, but decent. Uh, they told her she'd live uh, maybe 12 months without a mitral valve, and, uh, and it would have to be replaced, but her EF was 
you know, too low. Her ejection fraction was too low to, low to replace it. And, it, and it, now they found that she, the left ventricle shrunk so much that uh, we, it's barely leaking and it's not even a problem they're even worried about anymore. And the guy that was there, was the, he's their top cardiologist in their advanced cardiac team there at University of Alabama. There was a fellow who was with him and was trying to push some two new meds that they have there, that they have on the protocol. And she just kind of, mm-hmm. And then when the, um, the, um, uh, the main cardiologist comes in and he says, well, we do have two new two meds that we're using. She says, you know how I, how I am on this? And um, he goes, yes, I remember. And he says, let me tell you something. And he goes into the history of the patients that he sees there. And it's, it's all, you know, really critical folks that other folks can't fix. And they send them to that team there. And he said, um, he says, you know what's this important thing? He says, eating your fruits, eating your vegetables, getting your exercise does far more than any drugs that we have here that we can offer. Now, if that fella, the guy who was on his fellowship, had false teeth, they would have fall, fallen out. He could not believe he was saying that. But um, it's so true. Are we eating healthy food? Yes, you can look at these issues and address acute issues and chronic issues, but the bottom line, are we eating what we need to eat? Are we exercising? Are we, are we drinking our water? Uh, that's the foundation, those basic eight laws. And, and so many of us take those for granted. I know people come to me uh, from Joe and he's written prescription and they have the eight laws. I mean, that's a real prescription. That's a real prescription. Um, but we take it for granted. But truly, it is the, when we go to school and we have a test, and the teacher puts that key on top, and it has the holes punched in. And wherever you don't have black, they, they put red. That's the key. The eight laws are the key to health. They are. And uh, if we follow those eight laws, that's the first thing to do. It really is. So that's, that's given. Nutrition, exercise, water, um, sunshine, temperance. Temperance is making the right decisions. It's not just in what you eat and what you drink, but also are, are you making the right decisions on, on what you're talking about? Are you, are you gossiping? Gossiping's, gossiping's not healthy for us. Um, are, you know, fresh air, rest, but most important is trust in God. And none of the, nothing on the table here heals. Only God does the healing. Um, and we have to keep that very, very uh, up front. But let's look at food. Um, first thing is, what kind of food are we eating? Um, are we eating heirloom food? And it's interesting, as, um, as I look at heirloom, uh, our good friend Bob Jorgensen, uh, Bob shared many years ago the research he'd seen out of the University of North Carolina, Department of Agriculture, that foods that were hybrid uptook only 40% of the nutrients than heirloom. You got 40 cents on a dollar right there on nutrients. And that's what we're eating the food for is the nutrients. Yes, God gave us taste buds. And yes, we enjoy the taste of the food. But we're, the big thing we're after is the nutrition. And if based on which seed you put in the ground could variance 40% of what is available to 100% is available for that specific plant. That's huge. And that's heirloom. Another nice thing about heirloom is we can use it. We can, and that's what we're going to be talking about uh, at this class. And it's, we're not going to be able to use hybrid seeds and save those seeds unless you want Tommy Toes. Um, but you want heirloom seeds. But another thing about heirloom seeds I learned last year or year before last in a course I took, and that is around 1902, 1903, no, I'm sorry, 1903 it was. It was 1903. They started trying to figure out how to give food a longer shelf life. And they started use, spraying it with different things, and it was actually pharmaceutical stuff that they were trying to spray it with. 
uh, a uh, actually it was a derivative of aspirin is what it was, to, to give it a, a longer shelf life. But then they found that they could hybridize it and they could cause that the, those chemicals inside the tomato, that is heirloom, to go away or not, be not as much and it had a longer shelf life. Well, guess what those three chemicals in there were that they taught us in class? Amylase, protease, and lipase. God put digestive enzymes in our heirloom food. And as we learned in this course, they're finding that when we don't have adequate enzymes, that our body has to overwork to produce more enzymes or we have lack of enzymes and we're not properly breaking it down from macro to micro. And so a great source of digestive enzymes right here, heirloom seeds, the way God made it. Yes, we have mostly amylase in our saliva, but we've got some protease and lipase. But let's add those enzymes that God gave us in the food to assist in digestion. And then we have, you know, just basic things. You know, we've got our, you know, our, did you know that if you eat a, ser uh, a serving of nuts um, at least five days a week, it reduces your risk of a deadly MI, uh, heart attack, uh, by almost 40%. And it reduces your risk of a non-fatal heart attack by almost 80% significant by uh, eating. And have you all ever read the book Proof Positive? It's Neil talks about that in that book. Um, and there's just so much nutrients that we get in our food. Now we think of food being our nutrition, but can we also find nutrition out here? I was talking with a lady Friday. She, this little lady's 90 years old. Last year, how many quarts of green beans she put up, Mary Lou, last year? It was like 800. Really? Yes. Oh. It was a mess of green beans. Uh, and, and, and she's a little short lady, and she's having some leg problems, and she says, I've got to get this fixed. I've got I to gotta get out and put food up. <laughs> 90 years old. And... Um, and I was telling her some things that she could use uh, to get some edema down and just go out there and get some dandelion. Dandelion leaf is tremendous uh, for uh, edema. And, if you're ha and she was also having some kidney issues due to some medication she was taking. And so her kidney function was having some challenges. And I said, well, there's two more things out there. Your corn silk. I said, you ever grow corn? Yeah, I grow corn. You ever put corn up? Sure, I put corn up. You can just hear these old ladies. Uh, and uh, I said, how many truckloads of corn silk have you thrown away? She said, a lot. I said, corn silk is the best medicine for the kidneys. It's amazing for the kidneys. And I said, so keep your corn silk. And, and dig up your, your dandelion. And because you need both the leaf for the edema, and the root is also excellent for the kidneys. It's also good for the liver. I said, just cut it off and make you a decoction first, and we'll talk about that. I do a decoction and then make an infusion, the decoction of the roots, then an infusion of the leaves all together and make a tea. And that will help your kidneys to function better. And so God put nutrients here, and he put nutrients out there in our food. There's three ways that we can look at getting our nutrients. Um, we can look at the bulk herb, where you have things like skullcap. Anybody ever done skullcap? Anybody, did anybody know Dr. Walter Strachan? Strachan was a psychiatrist from over in Loma Linda. His last 14 years practicing as a psychiatrist, as a psychiatrist, he used no pharmaceuticals. He used things like skullcap. And he taught me to use skullcap for depression. Yes, it's good for anxiety and, 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 and stress and bipolar and schizophrenia and, and uh, you know, those 
stress issues, but he said, well, it's really good for depression. He said, take your quarter water, make an infusion. Now, an infusion, you can make teas, and you make either infusions or decoctions. An infusion is where you just bring your water to a boil, plumb turn it off, and let it just sit for at least 30 minutes or overnight. That's an infusion. And, think, and herbs are like people, like men and women. Y'all women are real dainty. Us fellas are a little hard, more hard-headed. And so the roots, the, uh, the barks, the hard berries like hawthorn, you want to make a decoction. So you want to simmer those for like 20 minutes. That's a decoction. But delicate things like leaves and flowers and, you know, that type of thing, um, you want to make an infusion. And that's where you just plumb turn the water off, let it sit for 30 minutes or overnight, strain it. And you can, you can even do a sun tea with it. Y'all know what sun tea is, where you leave it out during the day. And so what Strachan, uh, uh, Strachan told me, he says, take a quart of water, bring it to a bowl, uh, plum turn it off, make an infusion, and put one cup, one cup of, of uh, skull cap in there uh, to start with. And then he says you can make it thick as mud if they'll drink it. And it really helps well. So you've got herbs. And let's talk about some herbs real quick this way. Uh, ginkgo biloba. What do you think of ginkgo? Pardon? It works. What? Maybe you need it. It's good for memory. That's right. It's good for memory. Brain function. Memory. Uh, we've got, uh, let's see here. We've got go to cola. We've got chaparral. We got slippery. And what's chaparral good for? Cleansing. Yeah, it's a great blood cleanser. It's nasty. Uh, have you ever drank it? Huh? Yeah, it's kind of nasty. It grows in the desert of Arizona, the mountains of uh, California. If I have kids come in who are who are in high school, they have acne. Some chaparral, but they they're not going to drink it. So we just I have them take it as capsules. Uh, or a lady in her 20s, 30s who's having hormone issues, works good for the, um, for the acne. Someone brings their dog in to me, it's got skin issues, uh, take away the, anything that's got wheat in it, uh, in the dog food, go gluten free, and give it chaparral, and that will clean that skin right up. Uh, chaparral's good for cancer. Uh, it's an excellent blood purifier. Slippery Elm. Slippery Elm is, is an excellent one. I like slippery elm. Um, it's probably my favorite for a sore throat. Just take you a teaspoon, put it in a glass of water, stir it or a water bottle, shake it up, and when you sip on your water, it's going to go down. It's going to keep treating that cup. Any, anywhere from the, from the lips to the rectum, slippery elm is phenomenal of healing uh, the tissues. I use it in my colon formula, or actually I call it now the, the gut formula, uh, because it's good for, for stomach issues also. Uh, if they have ulcers in their stomach. But slippery elm is, is really, really good for, um, for healing tissue. And healing the tissue both inside and outside. You can use it outside in a skin formula. It's a little, I don't put it in my skin wound, I don't put it in my wound formula because it's, it's a little more sticky and messy to deal with, but it works very well. And I I'm, want I'm compliance, and so I want something they can deal with easily. You don't have to worry about eating too much. I had a guy from Cherokee tell me that the, the, the Cherokee folks, they would, um, they would um, when they would go from village to village, this is what they use for food, is they would bark the inner, elm, the inner bark of a, of a, of a uh, elm tree, the slippery elm, and, um, and eat that. Um, so it can be used as food. Probably the most nutritious of all the herbs in North America is stinging nettle. Nettle's phenomenal. Uh, it's excellent for female hormones. It's excellent for, um, it's got, if you're looking for a good source of calcium. Milk's not a good source of calcium. Uh, I learned at Cornell that you actually lose calcium when you drink milk or eat dairy products because it takes more calcium to break, break that protein down that then is in the milk product itself. So you actually have a net loss when you use the dairy. So it's true, dairy has calcium, but what they don't tell us is that it takes cal more calcium that's in it to break the protein down. 
Um, nettle is good for, um, don't be in Asia. Don't go to Asia and have an asthmatic attack. They will take your top off, strip your top, and they will whoop your chest and whoop your back with stinging nettle. It'll light you up. And it will stop the asthmatic attack. And then they will take and they will dig a hole in the ground and they will bury you just with your head out. And then the, the clay will, will pull that stinging out. But it works very well for an asthmatic attack using that. When I go to northern Wisconsin, northern Minnesota, I'll be in northern Minnesota week after next. It's not next week, week after next. Nope, it's next week. Yeah, next week I'll be in Minnesota speaking and up in the northern part just, out, just outside of Canada. And the ladies up there will take nettle and they will cook it as a soup or as a stew or they cook it like spinach. And uh, I talked to a lady from forgot what country in Europe she was from, but that was normal in her country to cook it. Uh, Rhoda, they cook it in Canada? Nettle? Um, but it, it works quite well. We probably sell it the most for female hormones, but it's also very good for allergies. If you're having problems with, with uh, allergies, like our southern allergies, it, it's very good for allergies. Turmeric. Turmeric's kind of hot right now on the market. Uh, it's an excellent anti-inflammatory. Dr. Agatha, I remember I was at a class one time and uh, someone, she was talking about using turmeric. She says each day morning I'll take a teaspoon in the morning to stir it in water and a teaspoon in the evening. And someone said, well, how much water? She says, well, how, how much nasty do you want to drink? You know, you know, for some people it can be pretty tart. Uh, and uh, a pardon? Oh, yes, exactly. That's nasty. Yes. Uh, so, but yes, turmeric is an excellent anti-inflammatory uh, uh, item. So you can do your herbs in uh, the, the, the bulk. So you can make teas out of it. You can make, uh, you make poultices out of it. Um, you can make capsules out of it. But what if you want to put it up? What do you do if you want to put it up? Why do we need to put it up? Emergency use. Emergency use? I mean, why do you put tomatoes up? That's right. Your tomatoes will not last, you know, until next season. You've got to, you got to can them. You got to put them up. Um, and so, uh, if you want to get a longer shelf life out of your herbs, herbs, you'd like to use them in six months. You'd like to. And so even for that year, it's best to put them up. And to do that, you can make extracts out of them. Uh, some people will make tinctures. Tinctures use alcohol, and I'd rather not use alcohol. And so you can use, uh, make an extract. And an extract uses vegetable <laughs> glycerin and, and distilled water. You don't want to be less than 25% vegetable glycerin or you can have pathogen growth. And so a lot of folks will do a 70-30. A it's real simple. It's a lot easier, seven to three. Uh, seven part vegetable glycerin, uh, three parts distilled water. Now don't do what I did. The first time, and it, what was that I did? It was wild lettuce. I did a wild lettuce. That's gonna make an extract. So I filled the container up with wild lettuce, and then I put my glycerin and, and you mix it. You put your glycerin in the bowl, put your, your, your distilled water in there, and you got to mix it good because water and oil don't mix too good. And so mix it good, and it finally you mix, and you pour it in, and, and it's just no room. And so I dug it out, and I made two quarts. You want to do it about half full. And then you want to put in your, your liquid, and it will keep soaking it up, and soaking it up just like beans when you're putting water in beans. The beans keep soaking up the water and soaking up the water. And, and you, wanna, you want that, that, that mixture about an inch higher than your herb, but yet you don't want to get closer than an inch from the top because you've got to be able to shake it. 
And so it may take you a day until you feel your full saturation. And then all you do is you just put it up in the cupboard and then you shake it twice a day. And what I'll do is I'll put it in the cupboard this way in the morning, shake it, put it upside down at night, leave it and shake it the next morning, put it upside on the top. You want it in a dark place. If you want to speed that process up, you can put it in a, a crock pot, a crock pot that goes low. Um, because you don't want to scald it or burn it. And you can put a, a little bit of, a, of a, a cloth and then have your water up like this. But that works. And that way, and now it's going to last all good two, two and a half years when you make an extract. And that makes it easy. Like if you want mullen, what's mullen really good for? Respiratory. Respiratory. Yeah, it's a bronchial dilator. It uh, works really well. Um, and, and instead of happen to, let's say you're out somewhere and you can't make the tea or carry the tea with you or going on vacation, it's a lot easier just to take the uh, extract and, and use the extract. And so we've got, we've got mullen. We've got organ grape root. Now what's organ grape root also called? Poor man's golden seal. Poor, it works like golden seal. Golden seal is expensive. Golden Seal, I sell Golden Seal right now for $24.98 an ounce. It's expensive. But Oregon Grape is a lot less. It's not as effective, but it does a great job. And so Oregon Grape can be used like Golden Seal. Milk Thistle, what do we think about milk, milk Thistle for? Liver. The liver. Yeah, I had a lady in Newport come in one time. She's a, a store owner down there, and uh, she came in to me. It's been 19 years ago, not 18 or 19, somewhere in there, uh, definitely not less than 18 years ago. And her skin was yellow. It was yellow. It was a yellow orange. Her eyes, her body, I mean, literally, she was a yellow person. And uh, her physician told her that um, she, uh, she was going to die. There was nothing else he could do. Uh, she was an alcoholic. And um, she had cirrhosis of the liver. And I said, the first thing is, you got to quit your drinking. And she says, I've done it. She, she drank wine. She, she drank wine. And she'd already quit the wine. And I said, okay, you're already 50% there. You've stopped the alcohol, the cause. And we did, uh, t three, uh, we did two milliliters three times a day of milk thistle, two milliliters three times a day of dandelion root. And um, that lady's still alive today. And uh, God blessed it, and she no longer has uh, cirrhosis of the liver. Uh, also, and to get rid of the jaundice, um, used uh, bentonite clay. If you have a baby that uh, is a little jaundice, you can put some bentonite clay on it, and it will pull that jaundice right out. Sarsaparilla. What do you think of sarsaparilla for? Testosterone. Uh, I get guys come in in their 20s and their testosterone is only in the 100 range. Way too low. And sarsaparilla works well. Um, I've got a friend of mine I used to work with. He's up in D.C. Uh, he's a surgeon. Now he does natural medicine. And he called me one day. He says, Walt, I have so many males coming in with low T. What's the best thing you found? I said, sarsaparilla. I said, you got to address root cause, but sarsaparilla works quite well. So... He called me several months later, and he said, Walt, that stuff really works. And when those guys would come, he'd have them come back in, he would test their testosterone, and yes, it was coming up. What lowers testosterone? There's a number of things, but three big things that I see. Alcohol's not good on it. Visceral fat's not belly fat. Visceral fat's not good on it. And sleep deprivation. Sleep deprivation can lower uh, the um, testosterone. Um, wheat isn't too well for it. And so sarsaparilla works quite well. We got patiarco. I like patiarco. Um, it's one of my favorite of the herbs. Um, for prostate, it's very good to shrink the prostate. Along with, um, I like using that and black seed. Uh, black seed. Both of these build the immune system, but also both of them shrink the prostate. Uh, patiarco is like Pac-Man. That's the first thing I like using for cancer 
it's like it's like Pac-Man. It loves eating cancer cells, and so Podiarco is very very good for cancer, and also very. It, the guys that come in with a high PSA, we see very good success using these two together. Podiarco and black seed oil, B L A C K. Now for the ladies in the Caribbean, uh, they'll call me and they'll put it in their hair. Uh, so it's good for, for the black women's hair, and it just makes it real pretty. Uh, it's a different kind, you know, it's a drier hair. Um, jewelweed, what's jewelweed good for? Ivy. Yes, <laughs> ivy, oak. Um, and so you can make, um, For let's see, what else do I have here? Cayenne pepper. What do we use cayenne pepper for? Blood pressure. Oh, on your food? Okay. Uh, pardon? Bleeding. Bleeding, yeah. It's excellent for bleeding. Um, pardon? I have guys that will come and buy this bottle right here, and they tell me it works better than nitroglycerin. And you know how they'll touch the bottle, their nitro bottle and it gives them a headache or whatever? They tell me this is, works better than the nitroglycerin uh, physiologically, and... Uh, um, it just it works quite well. When I had ulcerative colitis and I had a lot of bleeding, um, Phil had me use cayenne to stop the bleeding. I did two caps PRN, and it did. It would stop the bleeding, and uh, it kind of coagulates. It's kind of interesting how it does that. Many stories I could share with you about people bleeding, and, and actually the um, the the packs that they use in law enforcement and the military can have cayenne in it to help stop the bleeding. But it's also, cayenne is, it helps with circulation, so it's good for the heart. Yes, sir? There's a book called Left, Left for Dead. Mm -hmm. It's all about cayenne pepper. Hmm. Yes. Uh, it's amazing the stories that people tell with using cayenne pepper with people who have uh, heart attacks. Um, but also if you're trying to mix two herbs, Cayenne pepper is a good catalyst that will help to make those two herbs work better together. This is one that I, I do quite a bit, and it is um, black walnut and wormwood. What do you think that's good for? Parasites. And worms, yes, works good for that. Both, we use it on both people and animals uh, for it. It works quite well. Uh, let me go back to, let's see here, the milk thistle. So several months ago, I had a lady come in, and she was, she was crying, and she said, Walt, she said, I had a, do a horse die two months ago. I got another horse laying in the stall this morning. I can't, have, I, can't, I can't do another horse dying right now. And her vet had been there, it was on a Thursday morning, and he said there was nothing he could do for her horse anymore. The eyes, the whites, were very red. It was darker than, than, than Joe's shirt. Uh, very dark red. And um, he said, "There's your horse is dying. He had gotten into uh, some leaves. I forgot the tree it had gotten into. It wasn't cherry, it was another one. And the horse was dying. And the vet said, Nothing could be done. So I said, let's pray. Is that a good idea? It is a good idea. Uh, and I told a story where I had two goats that got in a rhododendron. And, um, and, I and I called the vet, and he said, Walt, I can give them Lasix, but that's only for your benefit. He said, there's nothing I can think of to do. And both Billy and Nanny got into it. Uh, we called uh, Dr. Mundy. Dr. Mundy told Mary Lou to send me back to work to get the biggest syringe I could get, and he came over. And um, he took a activated charcoal, and just slowly uh, we gave it by mouth, and the goats lived. I told the vet the next morning, called him, and he said, you know, they told us about that in vet school. He said, I forgot. Yes, that will work. Um, so I told the lady about the story, and actually my, na my Billy learned, my nanny didn't learn. And so she, what, two weeks later, I think, she got back into the rhododendron. Same thing happened again. She was shaking. She was vomiting. She was 
had diarrhea, and I mean, she was in bad shape again. Did it again. She learned that time, and she lived. So I told the lady this story, and I said, you want to try it on your horse? She said, I want my horse to live. Let's try it. So we calculated, you know, you got to calculate up for a horse. You know, I'm dealing with a dog. I got to calculate down. So we figured it for a horse. And uh, she went and gave it to the horse. She came in Friday morning, and she said the horse was standing, consuming some food, consuming some liquid. And she was excited. She says, now let's deal with the liver issue. I said, okay. So I said, um, the, if it was a, a, a human, I would do milk thistle and dandelion root, but I don't know a horse. I don't kill your horse. So she calls the vet, and the vet thought she was calling him to tell him that the horse was dead. And she says, no, it's standing, it's eating some, it's drinking some. Uh, it's look, and the eyes, instead of dark red, were just yellow like jaundice. He was excited. She said, Walt well, wants me to do milk thistle and dandelion if it's okay for a horse. And he said, absolutely, but don't give it to a cow. You'll kill a cow. But he says, you can do it to a horse. So we did. So again, we figured it out, and she bought, <laughs> you got to buy a bunch of these bottles when you're dealing with a 1,000-pound horse. And so she did it Friday, Sabbath, Sunday. Monday, she called me. She didn't even come in. She called me. She said, my horse is in the pasture. It's eating. It's drinking. It's doing just fine. And we did the milk thistle and the dandelion root. Does God love horses? Does he care about our horses? Our dogs? If he cares about the sparrow, he cares about all creatures. He does. So you say a cow does not eat dandelions out in the field? I, I don't know. It was probably the milk thistle I think he was concerned about, was the milk thistle. Because there's dandelion out in the fields. Yeah. Okay, so that is how you can put up your herbs to last longer. But let's say you want your herbs to last even longer. Well, you can, you can make them even stronger, and that is through um, uh, essential oils. And essential oils are, again, just herbs. And the way they make essential oils is they either do a, a distilling process or they'll do a, a pressing now, I like these essential oils right here for people who don't like to do water. Compliance is, is, is a huge issue in healthcare, whether you're whatever side you're on. You want the person to be compliant. If a person comes in and they're not drinking water, you want to figure out how to get them to drink water. People, how many people come in and tell you they don't do water? I don't do water. There's water in my coffee. Now, I don't have this anymore, and you may still, but I don't anymore. I don't have this one. There's water in my moonshine. <laughs> and when I moved back home 19 and a half years ago, it was not uncommon that the local men would say, oh, there's water in my moonshine. Can I count that? No, can't count your moonshine. Um, it's got to be plum water, only water. So, <laughs> so sometimes you got to... You got to negotiate. You know what I mean? You got to negotiate. It may not be plan A, but we got folks that ain't even on the alphabet. And so you got to get them to Z. I got people who come in that do no fruit, no vegetables. The vegetable may be potatoes in the form of french fries. You have those people. And so to tell them you have to only do plan A, a whole food plant based diet, and that's your only choice. They're going to spit the hook if you've ever fished. Um, and so you've got to figure out where they are. And so I use these for water. I might use a, a drop or two of wild orange. Now, you can't use it in plastic. You have to either use it in glass or a bottle like what you have. It's got to be metal. Is that a metal bottle? It's got to be metal or, um, or, or glass because essential oils will will um, dissolve plastic, and you don't want to drink plastic. So I like, you know, it might be uh, wild orange that they can use, uh, tangerine, um, peppermint. Now, one of my staff, she's now gone to college, but she worked with us when she was in high school. 
And um, she came to me her senior year and she said, Walt, well, she said, I've worked here and, and it seems as though y'all don't think drinking coffee's too good. I said, no, it, it's not. And I explained to her the, the physiology of challenges with coffee. She says, I only drink it in the morning to wake up as I drive to school. What else can I do? What's that? Yeah. I said, try this. Try putting two drops of peppermint essential oil. She tried it for a week and she came back and she says, I have more energy than the coffee. And it's true. If they'll just drink water, it's going to give them energy. You're right. So peppermint, and we'll come back to the peppermint on something else I use it for. Are all essential oils, can they be taken internally? No. All? No. What's it's a good question. What's the difference between your essential oils? That's a very good question. So, you, you ever been on a farm? Have I ever been on a farm? You ever lived on a farm? Yeah. Put up hay? Yeah. Okay. So, when your hays are growing, your nutritional value does this. And you pray that when it's here, it doesn't rain. Because you can't cut it when it rains. Because, you, you know, the problem's there. And so, um, the same thing is true for our food and for our oils. You want it to where it's at peak nutrition in the plant. And so you want a company that is concerned about not just smell or taste, but nutrition. And so you want a quality that is harvested when it's at peak nutrition, number one. Um, two, kudzu. Now all of us know what kudzu is. Kudzu grows the best, grows the best, and has the highest nutrition of any a kudzu in the world in the southeast United States. Better than China, better than Malaysia, better than you know any of those Asian countries that use kudzu. They think we're crazy because we don't use it. Um, so if you wanted to get kudzu, come get it in the south. If you want uh, lavender, you want to go to Europe. And so you, want, if you, if you, so you want to go to that part of the world where it, has, it grows the best in nutrition. And then there's some companies that, I was at the trade show up in, uh, in Baltimore, and there was a company there, and I used the company uh, but, uh, for some things, but not, I wouldn't, I'd be cautious with the essential oils. Um, they had helichrysum. And the helichrysum was a very good price. And the helichrysum was a one ounce bottle. And the cost was 30 something dollars at the time. Now, the helichrysum here in this size bottle, actually, it, no, in, in a half of this size bottle, which is a fourth of an ounce, was around $100. That's a lot, a lot different. And so I asked him, I said, what percentage in this bottle, what percentage of this is helichrysum? He said, oh, it's 100% helichrysum in there. Something's wrong. That can be a true statement. It can be a true statement. Maybe you add water or whatever, but it is 100%. That's exactly right. That's what it was. Huh. I said, well, how much of that one ounce is helichrysum? He said 10%. I said, what is the other 90%? He said, just other stuff. Well, I might not want to put that other stuff on my body or in my body. And so uh, you want 100%, 100%. You know what I'm saying? Um, and I'll argue with myself in a moment, to, and I'll explain. Uh, you could say, in this building is 100% is walk cross. Yes, I'm 100% walk cross. But there's other people here too. Now there is this one here, which this is oregano. This is P73. Who's used P73? It's very powerful. Um, if you're using all of oregano internally, you don't want to use 100%. It'll burn you. It'll burn your mouth. It'll burn your esophagus. It'll burn your stomach. It's hot. And even if you put it in water, it doesn't mix well and it can still irritate. So What's best if you mix it, 25% oil of oregano, 75% olive oil. 
and then you can take it internally and it doesn't give you the problem. So I do mix at times or buy it mixed, but I want to know exactly what it is. Why not buy the one already been cut? You, where it's already done, where it's already been, yeah, it's already been cut, yes. like 2575? Yeah. That's what this one is. This one's already 2575. I have some that's 100%, but then I would, I would, I would uh, mix those myself. Yes, it will say it on the bottle. It sure will. Um, all of oregano is like a is like a, a three fifty seven three fifty seven magnum. It is powerful, and it's something you can carry in your wa in your pocket. I've got it in my fire turnouts. I have it in my wildland jump bag. I've got it on my side of the bed. Mary Lou's got it on her side of the bed. If you feel like you're starting to catch something, if you catch it in the incipient stage, that beginning stage, you know how you feel, start feeling snuffy here or you're feeling something here? Immediately take this. Literally one night I woke up and I felt like I was catching something. And you know how you feel when you're catching something. And we were plumb out at the house. I was out in the car, didn't have any in the car, I got in the car in the middle of the night and drove back to Newport, 30-some minutes away. Pardon? You was unprepared. I was unprepared, yeah. But I didn't want to be sick that next day. And it was worth me waking up in the middle of the night, driving to Newport, and getting some. Fortunately, I've got some at work. And I took it, came back to home, went back to bed. But uh, if it's the incipient stage. You've got to catch it at the very beginning. Because if you don't, It'll cause problem. You wanna put something on top of these? Thank you. But all of oregano is amazing. It's a great antiviral. It's also good for bacterial, but it's an excellent antiviral. Uh, also in the water, might use lemon essential oil put in their water. Might use lime. You know those citrus are great to put in there, along with the peppermint, so it tastes better. Some other essential oils that I use, um, clove. What's clove good for? Clove? clove. Toothache. toothache. Yeah, it's the best thing I know for a toothache. Uh, it's powerful. You can, uh, my dentist, I go to a, a biological dentist over in, in Knoxville, and he says, you know, you can try oil pulling with uh, coconut uh, oil and some it works whether you're on the pharmaceutical side on the phytochemical side it's not a cookie cutter everybody's chemistry is different everybody's situation is different and so clove may be work the best for you the coconut oil work may work well salt water swishing with salt water may work well just find what works best but clove is a pretty big bat to use for that. It also, clove is anti-cancer. It kills cancer cells. Yeah. Tea tree, it's a skin issue. I mean, it's great for skin issues. If you get into poison ivy or poison oak, one of the best things to do is go wash it off, and then I'll take tea tree and just soak my area that got touched, and the tea tree oil cuts the oil from the poison ivy and the, and the poison oak. And you can, you can, it will wash it off. Yeah, it works really well. You know, kind of like when you're washing dishes and you've got a degreaser in your, and it w cuts that grease. Well, this cuts the oil from poison ivy and poison oak. But tea tree is a great product. I mean, there's so many more things. I'm just touching on it. Um, myrrh. Myrrh is good for any kind of a skin healing. Uh, but I also like myrrh for the gums. I had a lady come in one time. This was back in 05. And she came in and she said, um, she was just crying. And she reminded me of Kyler, uh, my grandson, over the last month. Kyler, these two teeth got loose. This tooth got loose. And oh, it was so painful for him to eat anything. And then, the, you know, they finally fell out. This one finally fell out. Rebecca, her teeth falling out now. And they're just, when they're loose, they're painful. Remember that when we were kids? 
And, you know, we went to school and we ate a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in our lunch box, and it was painful. Well, this lady told me, she came in, and every tooth in her head was wallering, just moving around like a fish. And she said her dentist said it was going to cost her $3,000. Now, this has been a few years ago, in 05. It's going to cost $3,000 to pull every tooth in her head and give her the cheapest set of dentures he could stick in there. And she says, I, I don't have the money. I have the money to pull the teeth. And she was just crying, squalling. And um, she could not eat solids. She was only eating soup. Uh, she could not eat any solid food because it was just so painful. And so what do you think we first did? We prayed, yeah. And um, so we went and got myrrh in, an, in a powder and got golden seal in a powder, took a teaspoon of each of them, put it in a... In a um, one cup of water, make it, made a, uh, an infusion, and, um, and I told her to swish for two minutes and swallow it um, four times a day. And then, in between times, put pine sap. Pine sap's amazing. Pine sap won't allow pathogen growth. And just push it up in there. And so, as you know, golden seal you've got to pulse it because golden seal, some natural antibiotics you can use all the time. Garlic, it's not a problem. You can use garlic every day and it won't hurt you. Garlic will not drop in efficacy. But golden seal, echinacea, some herbs, you've got to stop and then start back or you lose the, efficiency, the effectiveness. Well, so for two weeks I had her swish and swallow, swish for two minutes, swallow four times a day, and then for two weeks, spit it out. She was still swishing and getting it up in the gums, but spitting it out. So it wasn't getting systemic like it was the first two weeks to get in the blood. Then we went back and forth, back and forth. She came in six weeks later. And she comes in the store looking at me, just smiling. She goes... <laughs> yes, and she said, I just left the dentist. He says, I have no infection. He couldn't believe it. Could not believe it. Uh, God's good, isn't he? And, and just simple things. Myrrh, golden seal, sound familiar? Gold. But, uh, but myrrh's good. You can use it for, for, for I like, I really like myrrh for wounds, for skin wounds and any kind of wound. It's very, very good. Uh, pine sap, who's used pine sap? Anybody use pine sap? Um, Bob Jorgensen taught me to use pine sap. Uh, Carson went, he's a little kid. He was probably, he was probably four or five. And I had had a meeting in Hawaii for work and Mary Lou and the kids went with me. And we come back and Mary Lou's fixing dinner. Carson was sitting on a stool and we had high stews at the, uh, at the kitchen table. And Carson decided to eat with some chopsticks we brought back from Hawaii. Dropped one of them, leaned over to pick it up, fell off the stool, crammed one in the back of his throat, come up and crammed again back down in his throat, and he was bleeding. Mary Lou calls me. I was in a meeting at work, and I said, well, put some ice you know, on his throat. And um, I rushed home. We took him to the pediatrician. And again, I was still working in regular health care then. I just learned about this from Bob. I hadn't transitioned yet, but I'd learned about it. And all she said, all she did at the pediatrician's office, and it was a decent sized office, was a number of pediatricians in there. She called all the pediatricians in and said, look at these holes. And she says, well, I can't suture that. Uh, and she says, I can give you antibiotics. But uh, I was concerned about, you know, infection back near the spine and what all. So um, I said, no. And it was hard because I worked in healthcare. You know, it's hard to make those decisions until you can, you know, I just hadn't learned enough yet. But I decided to put pine sap on it. It healed very, very rapidly. And, and uh, he had no infection. Uh, pine sap's excellent for wounds, but do not put it on a puncture wound. Um, let's say your dog bites you, or your cat bites you, or you step on a nail. It will heal that top part, and you can have tunneling out. And you know what tunneling out is if you have infection down in and it tunnels back out. You've got to be able to irrigate and clean that area out well enough that you can do it. Who knows Franklin Cobos? Y'all know Franklin. 
So we were still living in Virginia. Mary Lou was working out in the garden one Sunday morning, ripped her hand open, and um, Franklin was, was doing, uh, he was doing some locum, ten, locum tenum for me. And so uh, it was cut open pretty nasty. So I took her into the office, and Franklin goes, he says, I can sew it up, or I can put some pine sap and sew it up. He says, you want to try some pine sap and sew it up? You know, Franklin, he just loves, you know, science and stuff. I said, yeah, let's try it. He said, I've done it before. It heals much faster. So, you know, he puts a little pine sap in there, sutures it up, and it did. It healed very rapidly. Pathogens won't grow in pine sap. Heals the tissue very fast. What about using oregano? I've never used that in a wound like that. Uh, it probably would be very beneficial. I know that this is very beneficial in wounds. Trace minerals, it's amazing putting trace minerals in a wound. Helps heal it a whole lot faster. It, it does, it helps with the pain also, the pine sap does. Yeah, so other things would help kill pathogens, yes. Um, when I first came back to East Tennessee, um, the mountain women, uh, Dario, Grassy, Cosby, they would tell me stories about when they would, uh, when they were little girls. Now these ladies are now dead, that's been 19, 18, 19 years ago, and they were up in their 80s. And so they're no longer alive, but their grandmothers would send them off to school, they didn't have school buses back then, and they'd send them to school with a piece of pine sap, and it didn't matter what community, they always associated with the size of a match head. You know the old match head you could strike on a stove? And, and they would chew that on the way to school every day. It would boost the immune system. Before then, this was back probably, this was probably around 2001. I was teaching a class, and this type of a class, and this lady in the back raises her hand. And she's a little old lady. And she says, can I tell you something about pine sap? And I said, yes, ma'am. Listen to old people. They can tell you something. And uh, she says, back in 1918, when I was a little girl, uh, she said, my daddy was a nurse. And he would go house to house treating patients with influenza. And um, he would take my brother and I into the houses, house to house. Well, that got my attention. She says, when we got home at night, he would pick a, take a pine knot, and they lived in Southern California. And she said that he would take a pine knot, and he would hold it over a fire, and it would get hot and drip pine sap into a glass of water. When it got hot, it would start dripping, and he'd put it into the water. And we all drank out of that glass of water. All three of them drank out of the same glass. And uh, she says, we never got the Spanish flu. I said, how many drops, how much water? She goes, I don't know, I was a little girl. So we know that pine sap is also good for boosting the immune system. I had one lady come in one time. She's since died many years ago. She says, boy, let me show you how to use that stuff. She opened it up, put it on her finger, and rubbed it on her gums. And she says, do that every day, and it will boost your immune system. But pine sap's really good. You can just go bark at a pine tree. And, uh, and we, my grand, all six of my grandkids have used this for teething. It's great for teething. Another one, uh, which is uh, an extract, is uh, corn silk. Now, these two are beginning, becoming more and more favorites of mine. Two essential oils that are just amazing. Um, I'm going to do something different here, y'all. Do you have a cup? Yeah. No. No, I'll just use this. Thank you. I need some water to drink. Y'all mind if I drink out of a bowl? I'm plum thirsty. I left my water bottle. So, <clears throat> these two here, we're seeing more and more anxiety especially post-COVID. Anxiety's big out there today. I don't know what's going on, 
but there's a lot of anxiety. I had a girl come in one day, and um, I was helping a lady at the counter, and um, I had four ladies standing there, and this girl comes in, and she walked, y'all know where my essential oils are, and she walked over there looking at the essential oils. And you know, you can just, you know, when you work with people, you can gotta get a feel on them. And my daddy taught me to read cows. We grew, I grew up on a dairy farm and beef cattle, and you watch your cows, you watch their eyes, you watch their, their heads, you watch their gaits, you just watch them, see their body language. Well, this girl, she was having some problems, I noticed. And so I asked for, excuse me, and I walked over and I said, are you okay? And she said, I'm having the worst anxiety attack I've ever had. And um, I said, just a minute. So I went back and I got my two. I used these. And I went and got these two. And I said, let me show you. Let your doctor try anti-anxiety medicine and take it first. And uh, so I put a drop of lavender here. And I rubbed it. It transdermally goes into the skin, into the blood, like a nitro patch or a nicotine patch. And you just rub it here and then breathe it. And when you breathe it, it goes into the lungs, into the, into the blood. And then I took vetiver. Who's ever heard of vetiver? Vetiver's powerful. It's called the, anti, it's called the PTSD essential oil. And I put a drop on my hand and put it here, and I breathed this one. I said, can you do that? She said, yes. So I put both of them on her, had her do it. I said, it's going to take a few minutes. Let me help these ladies first. You just stand right here. So I went back and I started helping back and I finished this one lady. It'd been about two minutes and um, Walter was sitting over in front of the herbs helping an, uh, another lady and he finished and he stood up and he looked over at me and I got his attention, let him know, help this lady now. So he walks over and starts talking to her. This young girl, she was in her probably mid-twenties, and it was a different voice, a total different voice. And so I stopped, and, and I just finished with this lady, and the other lady came, I said, just a minute. So I walked back, and I said, how are you doing? And she said, what did you just do to me? She says, it's gone. The anxiety is gone. And, and it's just amazing. I, had, I saw a boy just last week. And uh, he still uses this um, several years ago. Uh, now, this boy was just a kid back then, so it could have been eight, ten years ago. A lady calls me, and she says, my, my husband and my son are having some major anxiety issues. Can you help them when they drive in the car? I said, let's see if we can help. So they, she brought them, and I'd never seen this before. I mean, I've seen women do this, but I've never seen males do it. I mean, they were just hugging on each other, crying, and just having a connection fit. And I'm going, you know, like, what's wrong with these two? And uh, she says, that's what happens every time they ride in a vehicle. They just plumb fall apart. And, uh, and so I went and did the same thing. Put the oils on me first. Put them on them. They calmed down. Lady calls me when she gets home, and she says, I'm going to be back in to get that stuff. She says, they did fine all the way home. And I saw the boy just last week, and um, he come by, and uh, I was down in Hartford and selling some fireworks with the fire department, and he said, uh, I'm still using that stuff I get from you, and it works. Isn't it amazing? It's, it depends on the acuity. It depends on the person. Uh, but it can last an hour, two hours. And how do you spell those again? V-E-T-I-V-E-R. I'll look to make sure. I can't spell worth for it. V-E-T-I-V-E-R. I was in Crossville, uh, Tennessee, doing a, a class over at the Crossville Church. And um, on a Sunday, and this man comes up, and this eye here was going like this, just real fast, up and down. And this eye was just constant. And he said, I'm having a PTSD attack. He says, I'm a Vietnam vet, medic. And he said, I'm having a PTSD attack. Can you help me? I did the same thing. I put it on me first, put it on him. Less than five minutes, maybe four minutes, maybe. 
he comes back up, had total symmetry. This eye totally stopped. He says, my PTSD attack is totally over. And so God gives us, you know, just simple things. Yes, we need our water. Yes, we need our good food. Yes, we need our sleep. Yes, we need our exercise. You can't do away with that. I mean, that's the foundation. But these extra little tools that God gave us in our plants are very, very beneficial. There's one out of, I didn't bring it with me, but it's becoming a favorite of mine, another favorite, it's called Copaiba. Who's heard of Copaiba? Copaiba comes out of uh, Brazil. It comes from a tree. Trees are like 30 to 50 years old. And um, it works very well for, um, for shaking. Uh, I, I've got a guy now, he's, I mean, this guy, his epilepsy is so bad, he, he uh, had to quit working as a contractor. He's back working as a contractor. He'd fall off the roof. He'd fall off ladders. One day he came in, and we'd become friends. And uh, this is one of them guys that didn't do food. <laughs> you know, he ate junk. And he'd go to ham McDonald's. That was his food. And um, Mary, he wouldn't do no fruit, none. No fruit. Can you imagine not eating any fruit? Well, Mary Lou would make s smoothies in the deli. And I said, try it. Just just one taste. No, no. Well, finally one day, he wanted to please me because I'd helped him with some things. And he wanted to please me. And uh, he goes, okay, I'll do it. And so Mary Lou made him a smoothie. And he stands up there in front of the herb cabinet. He starts walking over to her. He may have taken two steps and he goes, uh, and he falls over having a grand mal seizure. That stress gave him a, a seizure. I mean, here he is flopping in the floor and um, having a seizure. And he actually chewed his tongue and it was bleeding. And um, some people say you can't chew your tongue. Yes, you can. I saw it. Um, well, it's been right about a little over two years ago. We tried Copaiba. He still hasn't had a seizure. It's been two years. Quite interesting. C O P I A B A. I think. But yes. Some people use. They'll take like five drops to go to bed and sleep. It can help us sleep. Uh, it's. It is considered possibly the most anti-inflammatory of the plant uh, uh, phytochemicals out there. Yeah, it's very anti-inflammatory. Um, so those are herbs that, that I use. Um, some other herbs I brought like this just to share with y'all. Um, Hawthornberry, what's that good for? The heart, yeah, hawthorn berry is really good. You can do a tea, you can do an extract, you can do capsules. There's, you know, different ways you can do it. Um, we already talked about the dandelion leaf. Cayenne pepper, you can do it as a capsule, or you can do it as an extract, or you can just do the powder. Um, The first question is, what's the cause? There's several causes I found. Stress seems to be a big one. Raises potassium, lowers um, raises cortisol, lowers potassium, um, and um, stress is huge. Uh, stress is probably the most. It's the biggest diagnosis in America. WHO says depression will surpass it shortly. Dehydration. That's number two. Yes. So stress is big. Dehydration. Dehydration, the blood's thicker and stickier. You you don't have enough hydration in the brain. You're more prone to stress. The kidneys um, need water, and they're the switches that regulate blood pressure. Um, it's through urination that you get rid of sodium, and if you're dehydrated, you're not getting rid of sodium as much because you're not urinating as much. There's a number of reasons that hydration is a big issue. Uh, it could, affects conductivity, which is the electricity in the body. The higher the conductivity, the more prone you are to uh, to um, hypertension and, and um, hydration and, and sodium affect that. Number three is is obesity. Outside ideal body weight, 
Um, and that's a lot of literature on, on obesity in that. Um, number three could be renal issues. A person's had kidney problems because it, you know the kidneys are so responsible for blood pressure. Um, it could be that they're eating a lot of salt. It could be that they have clogged arteries. It could be that they have hardening of the arteries. It could be have their cardiac issue. So you want to find the root cause of what's causing it. Uh, yes, Hawthorne Berry is excellent for lowering blood pressure. It works like three different types of blood pressure medicine. Um, Dr. James Schindler, who had an office in White Pine, then he went to Morristown, now he just closed that off, and now he's just opened an office in Oak Ridge. Schindler uses Hawthorne Berry for uh, hypertension. But it's not, it, but see, the problem I have with hard, Hawthorne Berry is you don't want to just jump on and start using Hawthorne Berry. If it's stress, if it's dehydration, if it's dehydration, you need to drink water. If it's stress, you need to figure out what to do for the stress. If it's obesity, you need to address the obesity and not just take the Hawthorne Berry. Um, another one that is just very common in Africa, in Rwanda, not in Kenya, but in Rwanda, and that is um, um, hibiscus tea. Hibiscus grows all over the place in Rwanda and hibiscus is good for blood pressure. Um, s putting the person in warm water, which is a vasodilator, can help because you now make the blood vessels bigger. So if you have a person, um, cayenne pepper. Um, who was it? I'm trying to remember which one it was. I think it was George, George Kim. Y'all know George Kim? is either Dan Castro or George Kim. We were at a class, and this guy asked me, he says, will you check my, my blood pressure? It was like 220-something over, uh, well up in the 220s, high 220s over, um, it was 130-something. That's high. And I said, is this normal for you? He says, yeah, kind of, sometimes. I said, this ain't good. So it's either Dan or George. I said, check his blood pressure. Make sure I took this right, you know. Yep, that's what it was. And uh, so they went and got some, got a blade of a butter knife. Well, got a butter knife and dipped it down in some cayenne pepper and put it under his tongue. And it significantly dropped. And we only waited probably 15 minutes. It significantly dropped. And then he went and got more of it and stuck more in it, and it dropped on down too. So cayenne pepper can, can if it's an acute situation, can get it down quick. Warm water can get it down because of the vasodilation. You don't want cold water, it's a vasoconstrictor. Um, so those are some things. But you want to get to root cause. What's the cause of it? Yeah. Fenugreek. What do you think Mary Lou uses fenugreek the most for? Any idea? Breast milk. Breast milk. Breast milk. For what? Oh, fenugreek. Yes. Um, fenugreek, she has ladies that adopt and be able to nurse the children. And so fenugreek is amazing. It, it really is. Um, use this along with mother's milk, and it can help with increasing breast milk. I'm a huge, huge supporter of breastfeeding. Uh, in 1968, Tennessee was the fourth healthiest state in the United States. Hard to believe, isn't it? 1968, Tennessee was the fourth healthiest state. In 2009, Did the fast foods come in after that? yeah. And I'm sorry, it was, it, was, it was 1969. 1969 and 2009, we were the fourth unhealthiest. So we went from the fourth healthiest to the fourth unhealthiest. And the way I got to know about this was I, at the time I was on the Cock County Health Council. And um, we kind of got a, a little fire under us from Nashville saying, you're one of the worst county, one of the worst counties in Tennessee. Uh, health-wise, do something. And so we started some projects and Tennessee started jumping on it. Within a year or two, we were, we had gone to, you know, we'd improved a little bit. 
But what was the big difference that Nashville found? Number one, diet. In 1969, if I went out to eat, it was to grandmother's house. You know? Uh, for diet has changed. 2009, I mean, literally I have people who come into the store that don't fix food at home. And I'm sure you have those people. Yeah. Number two uh, was what people drink. I had a guy come in not long ago complaining of type 2 diabetes. I asked him what he eats, got his weight, his height, what's he drink, how much water does he drink, don't do water, how much, what do you drink, I drink soft drinks. I think, boy, I, I want to say it was Mellow Yellow, but I'm pretty sure it was, but it was a soft drink. I said, how much do you do? He says, I do three liters a day. It is. In 1969, if we got us a cold drink, it was a lot smaller. And you didn't, you couldn't go and just keep filling them up, filling them up, and, and you know, at the, at the store. Why would Tennessee be any different than Alabama and Florida? Alabama is very, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, very close to Tennessee. Florida is a little different. Do you think it could have a cause that um, we're beginning to have bigger cities and less country people? I think... I mean, it seems like to me, if you go further south, you're going to drink more sodas than you would further north, where it's hot, uh, hotter. Yeah, it could be that. And of course, when you look at Mississippi, heavy uh, grease eaters, a lot of grease in the foods. I think genetically predisposed is one of the most misdiagnosed diagnoses. My cholesterol used to be 288. I, I wasn't into this yet. I was still working the regular health care. And um, I went on a no added cholesterol diet. And my cholesterol went to 104. That was without any statins. And the guys at work, they said, Walt, you got to go on a statin. Look at your daddy, your granddaddy. You're genetically predisposed. No, I was East Tennessee predisposed. Mm -hmm. If your granddaddy smokes and gets lung cancer, and your daddy smokes and gets lung cancer, and you smoke and you get lung cancer, um, it's not genetics. A kindergartner can tell us because you smoke, mister. When I went to UT, UT told us that Tennessee is the hardest mind to change in the United States. North Carolina is the second hardest mind to change in the United States. But the Appalachian mind, this right here, we're in the Appalachia, but the Appalachian mind of East Tennessee and Western North Carolina, UT said was the hardest of the hardest mind to change. If it's good enough for Paul and Silas, it's good enough for me. If it's good enough for granddaddy and daddy, it's good enough for me. And so, why do we have these problems in the South? Because we do what our, we're eating the foods that our mama ate and our grandma ate. And our wives learn from their mamas, you know, if they were from the South. And so, you, and so if you don't stick your head out of the box, you don't know any better. And then you're adding junk food. And the, yeah, now you're adding junk food, yeah. Um, I was asked to go to Kuala Lumpur in 2001. In, um, in Malaysia. And I asked them, what are the diseases in Kuala Lumpur? In a syndrome X. It was the hypertension, the diabetes, the high cholesterol, the obesity. I asked, what do they eat? Very first one, they said, Wendy's, McDonald's, Pizza Hut, American fast food. Then I said, what do they eat in rural Malaysia outside of KL? I said, what are the diseases? And they said, infections. What do they eat? Rice, vegetables, some fish. And I said, before American fast food went into KL, what was the diseases? They said infections. What did the people eat? Rice, vegetables, some fish. And I see the same thing is true when I go to Rwanda. 
and I go to Kigali. Kigali is the same thing. Kigali now has over three million people. President Paul is, is building, the, he wants to be uh, Singapore of, uh, of Africa within by 2030. And I mean, they're becoming more and more affluent. And so yes, you see McDonald's, though they don't have drive through McDonald's in, 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 in Kigali, but they do have McDonald's, they do have you know, junk food. And, and you're seeing, the when you're in Kigali, you see people that are doing this. They're eating bad food, and they're not exercising. Though Rwanda's good on exercising, but you can see a huge difference. They're not exercising as much as the folks out in the bush, and they're eating healthy food, and they're not getting those diseases. And so I think as we look at why Tennessee and Alabama and Mississippi, one, we don't like change. We hate change in the South. Um, and it's hard to get change. And we just do what mama did and granddaddy did and, and those folks. Florida, you had, a, you had a lot of move-ins to Florida. Florida used to be Old South, but Florida has a lot of move-ins. And so by 1969, you had a lot of people who'd moved into Florida from other parts of the United States. In your travel, to different areas. Do you find that Tennessee is very hard for people to have a mindset of using herbs in comparison to other parts of the world and in, in the country? Here in Appalachia, no. If you're talk, for example, Cock County, if you talk to the local people, they don't have a problem using herbs because that's what their families grew up using. Um, they're tired of of the medications not working, um, and and they saw that their grandparents and grand grandparents used them, and they're willing to use them. I see it more in rural America, in Alaska. I mean, if you want to if you want to connect with the natives, natives, the Alaskans, they didn't like white men. But when when I when I start talking herbs, and asking them about their herbs, well, they'll start talking to me now because they're talking herbs, but not. It, it seems to be more country versus city. City's not too interested in herbs. Even Nashville, Chattanooga, they're not interested. Um, honey. What's honey good for? Pardon? Sore throat? Sore throat? <coughs> Wounds? Anything else? Yes. Yeah, if it's local. But make sure it's plum, 100%. Tennessee law, because of Cock County, because of our state representative's wife, who's a nutritionist, um, some, um, some honey can be cut with other stuff like high fructose corn syrup. And let's say your children are allergic to corn. Um, so in Tennessee, it has to say, like this one says, 100% pure, unheated raw honey. If it says 100%, then it has to be 100% in Tennessee. Um, we don't want other things cut in it. So honey, honey's good. The Bible says a little honey is good for us every day. Blackstrap molasses. What's it good for? Catching June bugs. Catching June bugs. <laughs> arn. arn, yes. It's excellent for Arn. When I had challenges with my colon, my, uh, they couldn't get my hemoglobin above 7.1. And um, so I went to Phil, and Phil had me use a tablespoon twice a day. Shot it right back up, right where it belonged. Uh, so it, it works very well for, for iron. Green leafy vegetables are good for, for iron. Uh, but uh, blackstrap molasses is good. It's great for facials. Yes. Facials. Yes. Now, if you want to do a, a, a full facial, what you do is you get you some bentonite clay, mix it with some water, wait a day, and then... You don't have to wait a day, but it's just a little more creamier. And then put that on your face and leave it for about 30 minutes. And that will pull 
oils and clean your face really good. Wash it off and then put black strap molasses on it. And you don't have to put the bentonite clay first. You can just put this straight on your face now. And uh, it will just put all kinds of good nutrients in your face. It's soft. It's, it just glows. It's a great facial and very, very cheap. Works good. Would that draw bees to your face? It probably yeah. would. <laughs> how, long, how long do you leave that on? 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. About 30 minutes. <laughs> yes. Um, trace minerals. Minerals are, are really good. You've got your fats, proteins, your carbohydrates. Then you've got your vitamins, which are catalysts that kick on your fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. Then you've got your minerals that are a catalyst that fix on, kicks on your vitamins, that kicks on your fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. A lot of our minerals are, are not there because they're, they're eroded off the soil. Um, you're using hybrid seeds versus heirloom seeds. You're eating processed foods. Whatever the reason is, mineralization is literally that you've got to have this guy to kick on these guys to make them work. And it's amazing what taking trace minerals will do to boost the nutrients and give you energy. They really do. Um, now, this recommends 20 drops two to three times a day. Um, but this is really cool. Um, it works also for plantar fasciitis. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it work over and over. I had someone just last month that came in and it took them wasn't long because he came in, he had just got diagnosed with it, he had problems, and usually guys don't go to the doctor, you know, y'all women do, because I think you're trained that way with your OBGYN, uh, but most guys don't, uh, but he is one, and he was having some foot problems, went to his doctor, got diagnosed, plantar fasciitis, came in, said, what can I do for it? So I told him a teaspoon twice a day, and he told me in a week and a half, it was plum gone. Normally it's two to three months, but a year ago, two years ago, I, my foot felt like plantar fasciitis. So I went to Ken Matthews and I said, Ken, check my foot out. What do I have I got? He checked it out. He says, you got plantar fasciitis. I, I got a shot for that. I, no, I want a shot. I just want a diagnosis. I thought it was plantar fasciitis, but I want to make sure. Ken goes, yeah, you have plantar fasciitis. It took me two weeks totally gone. Um, and so it works great for that. We've also seen benefits in uh, using this along with calcium magnesium for bone spurs and we see benefits for that. But, but this is good for stress. Uh, it's good for kids who have uh, uh, ADHD. You know, it gives them nutrients. It's nutrients to the brain. So it works. That's a great idea. It's called SOL. And what you do is, uh, now Barbara, she will take and put, Barbara O'Neill, she'll put some salt in the water. Another way you can do it is you make SOL. And the way you make SOL is you take and you, let's say, you take your, say, a jar like this, and you, and you fill it up about an inch on the bottom, let's say with Celtic sea salt. And then you put your water in it and shake it up really good. And then you, uh, you shake it up real good. And then you let it come clear. And it will come to a certain um, salinity of mineralization. And you just take a teaspoon of that once or twice a day. And that will do very similar. And then you just keep shaking it and doing it, every, you know, say twice a day. And then when your water gets down, you just put more water in it and it's just going to keep the right salinity or if you run out of salt you just add more salt and it's called SOL. I forgot the ac what the acronym is for. How much salt do you start with? Uh, just put an inch in there. It don't matter. Just about an inch. And then when the salt wears down put you some more in there. It's a cheaper way of doing it. You're welcome. I used to use a product called C90. C90 was a tremendous product but the problem was is when Fukushima happened they were having problems uh, testing the water. It comes from the Sea of Cortez, and they were finding well, the water was tainted, and uh, so I quit using it. Not the microplastics in Pardon? Microplastics in any salt. 
I don't know. Tell us about it. No, I'm just, that's a concern I've heard raised. Oh, I don't know. I don't know on that. Micro. We are. Oh, microplastics, like plastic. Oh, yes. That's a good question. Then you then you have the issues of estrogens with the microplastics. Absolutely. Um, have y'all ever used H two O two? Food grade hydrogen peroxide. Take it internally? Mm -hmm. yeah, I've got 12 drops in a glass of water and I put sea moss and mm -hmm. chlorophyll and the white two dots drops of iodine and yes. mineral, my minerals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's amazing. Um, you can't use just regular peroxide. Uh, the key. It's got a stabilizer in there. It's poisonous. But this is food grade. It is the best thing that I have found for um, uh, candida, for yeast. And you work your way up to 25 drops three times a day. Uh, start with one drop three times a day uh, in some water and um, work your way up somewhere between day 10 and day 20. You're going to get sick if you have, say, candida. And it's, a, it's the, it's the uh, Hertz syndrome. And part is the die off, yes. And it will take three to five days. And so let's say at your day 16, then you go back to day 15, drop, 15 drops until you, the Hertz syndrome's over. And then you continue on up to day to 25 drops, three times a day uh, for say two months, come back down one drop a day. It's amazing of what it does to candida. People use it for cancer also. Most folks say to use uh, 50 drops three times a day, work up to that. There are people out there that use 75, 100, 125, 150 drops three times a day. I don't recommend that. It's very effective, but I don't. Re uh, it, it's it'll make you plumb sick. Um, 50 drops is pretty normal. A lot of the documentation is at 50 drops, so just do your research on that. But uh, on the for cancer, you don't have to go up a drop a day. We'll leap up three drops a day, three, six, nine, twelve, till you get to 50 drops three times a day and stay there. And uh, it, I've seen brain cancer, plum gone. I've seen prostate cancer, plum gone. And this is all the peop thing that people did was just this and pray. And people will call and they'll say, what do, I, what do you do for cancer? So my response to them is, is I share with them about three pages, four pages of things that I've seen can be beneficial. And then they'll say, well, what do I do? And I say, I don't know. You gotta ask the medical director. God and ask him what you need to do and um, it, it's some people then will do one thing they'll do several things the tough thing about cancer it's a very deadly uh, disease can be um, and the question out there is why do you have what appears to be the same cancer the same protocol and you have two different outcomes um, and, and we're like a kid, like a five-year-old, and we go to our parent and say, why, 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 why? The other day, uh, Carson's a little boy, he's four, and he asked Mary Lou something, she answered him. Then he said, well, why that? She answered him. Then he said, well, why that? And he just kept saying why to every one of her, her answers. And finally she says, you'll, you know, you just have to trust me, <laughs> you know, you'll understand someday. He's four years old. God does that to us. And why does he heal one person versus another person? That's outside of our scope. We have a finite mind. And we just have to go to that eighth law that says trust in God. Just as we expect our five-year-old grandchild to obey us, just trust me, don't go out in the road. But my ball went out in the road. I'm sorry, you can't go out in the road. But I want my ball. You can't go out in the road. And sometimes we're like that five-year-old. And, and God, I believe, just as we tell our five-year-old grandchild, someday you'll understand, God says, you know, his response will be, when you get to heaven, I'll explain it to you. Uh, that's the challenge with cancer. Um, and I see folks that, that heal and folks that don't. 
And it's not just with cancer. People die with other things too. Uh, I work a lot of car wrecks. Um, so, Who has ever used lecithin granules? Lecithin granules. This, I call this rotor rooter. Um, it's amazing. Drano. What's different than that is liquid. I like this one because I can see it. It's, it's I, I know, it's. I use the liquid. It, and, and if it's a good quality, it's just as good. Yeah. Um, but it, what it, I had a lady come in to me. She was from New York, and both carotids were 75% occlusion. Within two months, she was at 25% occlusion. It just, it dissolves the plaque. I had a guy come in to me three weeks ago and uh, he had a significant occlusion. Went back to his attending and she laid out the whole thing that I had recommended. I'm thinking, oh boy, what's he going to say? He says, keep taking everything, especially the lecithin. He says, that works. It does. It just, it's amazing. It just, it, it dissolves that plaque, you know, the atherosclerosis. Tastes good on grits. Does it? Okay, good. Um, anybody use colloidal silver? Colloidal silver is good. Yeah. Uh, colloidal silver. Yeah, it's it's a good item. Yeah. If you get something in your eye, the best thing I have found, if your eye gets scratched, or or something hurts your eye. Vitamin E oil is the best thing I found to heal it. Both the pain goes down significantly and it heals it very rapidly. Uh, vitamin E oil works very well. Just take a capsule or whatever. Not essential oil. No, just, uh, it's just vitamin E oil. Just the vitamin E oil. I know another old-timey remedy. Yes. Uh, anything with eye infection, uh, a mother's breast milk. So oh, you're absolutely. Nursing, uh, it, it'll clear it right up. You're exactly right. Yeah. It, either mother's breast milk, uh, raw cow's milk, raw goat's milk. When you, when you go to Africa, even in the Appalachia, the old women in Appalachia, or even in the Caribbean, uh, it's not uncommon to see a lady squirt breast milk in the baby's eyes three to six months just to keep any infection down. You're exactly right. Um, any kind of, my favorite for eye infection is... Um, I, I wear contacts, and I had a contact maybe a month ago that I had taken out was bothering me, and I just, out of negligence, didn't clean it good enough, and I got an eye infection. And I went to see a friend of mine um, that day who's an optometrist. I said, look at my eye. I said, tell me, have I got an infection in there? I mean, it's red as a beat. And he says, yeah, you got an infection in your eye. And, uh, and, uh, I went back and I took um, I took an eighth of a teaspoon. Now this is far too much. It's just hard to measure down. Eighth of a teaspoon of golden seal. To uh, and I put it in uh, a shot glass, a one ounce shot glass, and um, and then I put an ounce of warm water in there, hot water, and I made an infusion, and then I just um, Put it in my eye. You put it in my eye, didn't you? Merely put it in my eye. Yeah, I strained it first. You, it's, yeah, you want to strain it first through like a coffee filter. It's the only thing a coffee filter is good for. Uh, but a paper towel, the problem with paper towels is they wick so much. Even the coffee filter will wick, and you don't want to lose your, your product. But a coffee filter wicks. But if you don't have anything else, it, it'll work. But you don't want those granules in your eye. And so strained it off and she put it at one dose the eye infection went away one dose yeah have you ever used Tormatil? no I think it's also known as five fingers I've heard of it but I haven't used it it, it works good I've had a stab it's just, it just you get something in there just wraps it up and throws it out your eye really super good stuff Tormatil. what was the name Tor of that? Tormatil Tormatil is a, a, a plant that grows wild everywhere okay See, God, the cool thing there is God has things all over. Soon, are we going to have challenges buying things? And so can I get chaparral growing here? I love chaparral, but I can't get it. But God gave us burdock. God gave us golden seal. 
God gave us red clover. And so there's, God gave us multiple things all over the world that we can use in, in our neck of the woods. What about dry eyes? Dry a, a good friend of mine, uh, actually, who, who, uh, I went, who I went to see, he's an optometrist, to look at my infection. And uh, he worked with me for two years at the store. Just came in and volunteered. And, and anytime someone came with an eye issue, I'd always stick them on him so I could learn what he had to tell them. And uh, the first thing he would say for dry eyes is, how much water are you drinking? Now, my, the optometrist I go to, he says that they're finding out that dry eyes could be because not enough oil. And so what he, he has some of his patients try is they'll put, um, a, like one of them mask women wear at night to sleep, and he puts little pouches in them that warms up. You got to be careful. Don't put real hot in your eye. That can hurt your eyes. But just warm, a warm cloth over your eyes at night, um, that can increase the oil in the eye. And he's finding that is helping with patients with dry eye, and he's not having to use his, uh, his eye drops. I use CanSee. Really? Anybody ever heard of CanSee? Yeah. CanSee is a great product. Um, it's, I don't use a lot because you don't want to use a lot of it, but it, it, it's used for, um, there's a surgeon out in California developed it, and it's used for, what he found was is the eyes clog up, the sewer system on the eyes clog up, and this unclogs them. And so it, it caused, like glaucoma, uh, when they use can the, the the pressure comes down. It also is good for cataracts. Veterinarians use it on dogs. It doesn't work as well on cats, but they use it on dogs. Do you think that, that works good for cataracts? It does. It yeah, it does. Yeah, I've seen cataracts go away. It works faster on dogs, though, than on us. But you, so I'm, if my eyes get dry, I'll put a drop in, and it's just good health of my eye anyway. But water's the key. I've got to keep drinking my water out of my bowl. Um, aloe vera, it's tremendous. It, it's really, where it's gastro issues, I'm sure you've used it for gastro issues. Um, it's, it's very, very good for, whether it's the stomach, the colon, um, outside. You know, just like you got tissue inside, you got tissue outside, you use it for sunburns or whatever. But aloe vera is very, very beneficial. We've got just a few minutes left, so let me look at a few things to make here. Has everybody made a tater poultice here? Mm -hmm. A potato poultice? You just grate a potato. Um, I had this guy come in to me. Um, he, was, um, he was a maintenance fella, and the furnace wasn't working. So he goes into the furnace room and the light wasn't working. And so we're starting to see some preventive maintenance issues here. And so the light wasn't working, the furnace wasn't working. So he goes out and he turns the furnace off at the, uh, the valve. And he goes in and he gets out his Bic lighter and goes down and he clicks it. Well, also the valve on the, on the propane tank didn't work. And it exploded. We've got some major preventive maintenance issues here. It exploded, and he and from here up, he was red. It burned his eyelashes, eyebrows, burned his hair up across here, and then not only that, he had flames up his face, flame marks like a '56 Chevy, and and so he came in, put him on the exam table, and uh, the first thing I did was aloe vera. His face soaked up a quart of aloe vera. I just kept putting it on, putting it, and I used gel, so it stuck on there better, and just kept absorbing it and absorbing it. And then my grandma taught me to use taters. And so we started grating potatoes, and it wasn't fast enough. And then I told the kitchen, the dietary department, just start using your, your Cousinart food, you know, and just... And so we just, and we treated him for five hours. Back and forth, back and forth between potatoes, 
pouring aloe vera on the potatoes and just aloe, and then aloe vera. And we just kept going back and forth. But have you ever got sunburned and you and you use vinegar? And you vinegar is the best thing I found for sunburn. You just get vinegar, put it on a washcloth, put it on your burn, and you leave it there until the washcloth gets hot. And then and then you rinse it in your bowl, put it back on. And just keep doing that until your water here is hot. Then you put this in the freezer and you get you another bowl of vinegar and just keep doing it. And it keeps pulling that heat out. Well, what we did for him is we kept doing it until the potatoes got hot or the, uh, or the aloe gel got hot. And we ran out of aloe gel in a bottle and we had um, someone had... Uh, uh, donated a bunch of aloe plants and we had them down in the uh, in the greenhouse well i had some therapists from venezuela and colombia but do you think they knew how to make aloe vera gel absolutely so i sent them down to the greenhouse get aloe plant and they started making aloe vera gel and we just kept doing back and forth the only place we put aloe vera pieces on his eyes and then we left enough for his nostril for him to breathe but all of this area here neck everything was just plastered with either aloe vera gel or potatoes that whole five hours. How did you put the potatoes on? You said you I grate, we grated it. And just put them on like a, a paste? Uh, we just, it, it's wet. And then we finally went to the Cousinart, and that worked even better. And we just kind of just put it on his face. And then we add a little gel in there, aloe vera gel with it. And we just kind of molded it on there. Did it for five hours. Brought his wife in, taught her what we were doing. She took him home, continued. That man had no scarring. No scarring at all. And he had dark pigment skin. He was Filipino. And none at all. And, and it's amazing. Um, let's see here. Propolis. Have anybody ever used propolis? Propolis, if you ever had bees, it's that brown stuff that's kind of sticky. It's the glue in the hive. And bees use it for gluing and, and filling little holes. Or if you have a mouse that dies in the, um, in the, in the hive, they will mummify that, that mouse with propolis and pathogens won't come out. Well, you can make a propolis extract and it's good for sore throats. It's good for wounds. Uh, it's, it's a good product. Castor oil pack. Has everybody made a castor oil pack? Castor oil, I won't open this one, but to show you an illustration, um, you can take a man's white t-shirt and let's say you have an area that's, um, say, is, you know, this big. And so what you do is you put, you can daub this full of warm castor oil. Now, why do you want warm? It's a vasodilator. And so then you can apply it to whether it's a breast tumor or uh, uh, fibroids or um, cysts. Um, it, it works well. And so you apply it to the affected area. Um, or another great one, shingles. This works. Shingles is great. 800 milligrams of olive leaf extract. 800 milligrams olive leaf extract three times a day. That's an antiviral. It will kill, vi kill the shingles virus. Then because stress exacerbates shingles, use B-complex 100, one each meal, and that will help with stress. And then let's say the woman has it through here. A lot of times it can be under in this region here. Apply then this on the shingles, and it will cause them to dry up and go back in. Or if you just still just have pain, put that on there and leave it on. Put a piece of saran wrap on there, you can actually put a heating pad on it, a hot water bottle. And um, some people will leave it on for 12 hours, take it on, put one right back on. I like leaving it on for about 11 hours, take it off, let it air dry, and then put another one back on uh, because your skin needs to breathe a little because you got plastic on it. But uh, castor oil works extremely well for shingles, but it also can help with uh, tumors and cysts. Uh, um, can be quite beneficial. You can, uh, you can actually put it on your, on your eyelids uh, for cataracts. Some people even just put it in their eyes. 
but um, some people will put it on their eyelids and they'll use it for, for, for cataracts. Let's say if you have shingles up in the scalp, well, it's kind of hard to do a poultice, and so you can just put it on the scalp, on the head, and put a shower cap on, and that can help. Uh, has anybody ever done a cabbage poultice? A cabbage poultice? Snake bite. Snake bite? It, pulls. it does. Pardon? Just knee pain. All kinds of stuff. Just don't do what I did. I went and I had a guy fly in from England. He had hemorrhoids really bad, and they couldn't fix them over there in London. So he flew over to Virginia, and uh, so we were treating his hemorrhoids, and it worked quite well until one night. It was about 9 o'clock. He came to me for his, for his cabbage poultice. And I looked in the refrigerator, and we were out of green cabbage poultices, but I had a purple one. And um, so I got a purple one instead of driving into town. I would have been better to drive into town. I stained his underwear, his pajamas. I stained the carpet. I stained the bedding. I stained everything. I mean, that stuff just caused a mess all night long. And so what you can do is you can beat it to where they call it bleeds. With a, you know, you can take a, a rolling pin or something and beat it, beat it with a hammer until it, it bleeds. You, or you can put it in a cushion art and, and apply that that way. And yes, you can put it on all kinds of stuff, uh, whether it's hemorrhoids, wounds. Uh, but uh, it's good for drawing. Yeah, pain. You can put, you know, broken arm, you're out in the woods, but you got some cabbage, it can help with the pain in the interim. Well, y'all, I think I'm running out of time. Mustard, how, how many of y'all done a mustard plaster? Mustard plasters are real simple. Uh, you use um, one part mustard, three parts flour, whole wheat flour. White flour, first of all, you shouldn't have white flour. But the second part is it's real sticky and messy. And whole wheat flour um, is not as sticky and messy. But that's what you start with. One part mustard, three parts whole wheat flour. Now, the, the difference in mustard and cayenne, cayenne is measured in heating units. Go down to the pepper palace and you can have some that's over three point something million. Carolina Reaper. But mustard, they don't measure it. And so you don't know how hot it is until you use it. So you mix it up. One part mustard. How much flour? Three, Three parts flour. Mix it well and add you enough water that your consistency is uh, biscuit dough. The consistency of biscuit dough. And then I'll take a piece of saran wrap, put it out, put it on there, put the saran wrap on top, roll it out until it's an eighth of an inch thick, and then pull it back. The difference in a, in a, in a mustard plaster and say a charcoal poultice is a charcoal poultice pulls the toxins into it. A mustard plaster just brings blood to the area. And, uh, and you can use it over and over and over. But how long do you apply it? Kellogg recommended 10 minutes. Some people do 20 minutes. If at three minutes they say I'm getting hot, don't say Walt said 10 minutes because you can blister them. You can blister the skin. And so if the patient says I'm getting hot, take it off. That's why you do not put it on children less than three years old because they cannot adequately let you know that and you don't want to scar that child. Um, but mustard plasters can be used for pneumonia, for pains like arthritis, and uh, you can take it off, put it on later, and put that same one back on the area. Let's see where we are time-wise. Yeah, we're the last one. Let's see here. Yeah, the last one is the charcoal poultice. And I'm sure y'all all have done charcoal poultices. Uh, I, the first charcoal poultice Mary Lou ever made for me, I, I was mowing the yard, and I wasn't at all into this yet. She was into it before I was. And... Um, I was mowing one Sunday and I ran over a yellow jacket nest and I got stung by 30 some yellow jackets. And I was just shaking, just shaking. And I went in, laid on the couch, and she went and got charcoal and mixed it with water and put it on all those little spots. And, it's, and it wasn't long, I went to sleep. But I woke up again shaking again. What do you think happened? How did she make it? Charcoal 
and water. She didn't have a binder, so it didn't stay moist. Charcoal has to be wet, moist, in order to draw. And it adsorbs. It doesn't absorb, it adsorbs. And um, <clears throat> so she assessed it, what's different? And then she realized it was dry versus wet. So she rehydrated, and she kept rehydrating them, and that worked. Then we found we could use flaxseed and grind flaxseed and, and mix it with it. But then I hired a guy out of Sw uh, Switzerland. Yeah, Switzerland, a therapist out of Switzerland. And he used psyllium. Um, here it is right here, psyllium powder, not whole, psyllium powder. And you want it as fine as you can get it. And you'll use equal parts, one part psyllium, one part charcoal, and mix it thoroughly. That's a key. Do not put your water in until you mix it thoroughly because your psyllium will congeal and your charcoal will be a mess. So you mix it. You've got tan. You've got black. Mix it till there's no black, no tan. It turns gray. Then you can add your water. But add your water all together because it's going to congeal very fast. So you're going to be somewhere between five and six parts water dependent on the psyllium that you have. Average 5.5 .5 to 6 is what I find. And so if it's a little too wet, the next one you make, you know that psyllium, you'll use a little less water. Or if it's a little too, too tacky, then you can add a little more, um, a little more um, water. So you mix it up, and then you add your water. And at first, you think he's plum crazy. There's too much water. Because you mix it, and it's just slopping around in the water. After about 45 seconds, it starts getting hard. And you just keep, and it turns into a black ball. I'll usually mix it for about two minutes until I mash it and, you know, like kind of kneading bread with that spoon until I got this big old black ball. Then I'll take the saran wrap and set it out, put the black ball on top of it, put a new, another saran wrap, smash it down, roll it out to about a fourth of an inch. Now, the, the mustard plaster I roll out to an eighth of an inch. The charcoal I roll out at a fourth of an inch. There are people who roll charcoal poultices out to an eighth of an inch. Um, but I do them at a fourth of an inch, and, and they work well. Um, wait a few minutes and let it dry a little bit. The tackiness is less, and then you can apply that. Uh, you have to watch charcoal poultices because if you have an open wound, you can tattoo. Uh, so we just put a wet piece of paper towel in between, and it'll draw through there. Now, when we were in Venezuela, do you think they have paper towels? In Venezuela, they had a rule. If you had to go to the bathroom, for whatever reason you had to go to the bathroom, you had two squares. No more. You think they had paper towels? No way. And so they used sheets, and they would wash them and boil them and use them over and over and over. Um, but it will draw through a sheet also. Uh, used to, when I made them with, with flaxseed, I would put my poultice in a paper towel, and it works quite well. But it's less messy with the psyllium. It's much better. And when you're when you're kind of don't have enough psyllium, you can actually do a combination between the flaxseed and the psyllium, and it will draw. And the last thing, uh, charcoal internally. Always remember, you can't take charcoal within two hours either side of a script of a medication. Even Alimed, we're seeing that it Alimed is. You know, even that, you, you don't want to use charcoal within two hours either side of it. Because if we get a girl come in and she's on uh, birth control and, uh, and she takes the, the charcoal within two hours, a birth control pill is not going to work tonight. Whether it's the linoxin for the tachycardia or for whatever it is. You want to make sure. Any questions? How much psyllium and charcoal? I do 50-50, so it depends on how much I want. So it's kind of like... Depending on, the, on what I'm trying to, to address, like I have a person come in and, and I need to do their whole from their knees down. Uh, but you said five to six cups of water. Parts. Did I say cups? Yes. Yes. Parts. I'm sorry. And then you, I make bigger ones. That way, you know, they can cut it off like cutting off biscuits or cookies. And, uh, and if you've made too much, making it with the psyllium, I put it in the refrigerator, it will mold on you. It's just like grandma's bread. 
If you didn't eat grandma's bread fast enough, it's going to mold on you because it doesn't have preservatives. The psyllium does not have preservatives. It will mold. It, about a week. And so if you have more than a week made, cut it off, stick it in a Ziploc baggie, baggie and stick it in the freezer. And it'll last years. Any other questions? It depends on what you're using it for. If uh, The best thing I found for food poisoning is charcoal. Whether you take three capsules or a teaspoon, put it in a glass, stir it and drink it. If you have, a, have you ever had a person who couldn't hold anything down? They couldn't hold water down. They couldn't hold everything down. I had a girl, 29 years of age, pancreatitis. Um, she was in New York City. Her brother's internal medicine, his wife's internal medicine, the hospital. She'd been on Hyperal for three months. They said, we're not having any success. Send her home to die. This was in 2000. Sent her home to die. And um, what saved that girl's life, yes, is Jesus. But the father had a big part there. They were Korean. And though the son and daughter-in-law were physicians and the father was not, uh, took the daughter home at 29, and the brother tells the father, there's nothing else can be done. And he says, send her to this place. I have a friend who went there with cancer, and he was healed. And they didn't argue with him because they're Asian. Yes, sir. She came in on a Monday morning. Uh, she could not ambulate on her own. Um, even the even her her gown touching her abdominal region, she she had it just very painful. They sent her home again. She had not had anything, any food by mouth, only hyperal or TPN, total parental nutrition. Uh, you know, no food. So we tried giving her water, she threw it up. We tried giving her juice, she threw it up. We tried food, she threw it up. We tried activated charcoal, stirred it up, drinking it, she threw it up. So Monday night, we tried all day. She just could not hold anything down. So I called Phil Collins that night. I said, Phil, I got, here's the situation. I got a girl, I can't get her to hold anything down. I said, I know what I can use, an old pharmacist taught me. But I said, I'm not going to use it. It was, I won't say it here because you're, but um, it's something you go to the grocery store and buy, but it's not healthy. Uh, I've used it before, back when I worked in regular health care. But um, I said, I'm not going to use that on it because I don't, I don't believe God wants me to use it. It's a food product. But um, he said, you use the activated charcoal just like you use that other item. And he says, you make a slurry water. And he said, take it. Take a glass, um, put a teaspoon in it, and stir it. Wait 15 minutes. Give her a quarter of a teaspoon and stir it. Wait 15 minutes. Give her a quarter of a teaspoon and stir it. Wait 15 minutes. Every 15 minutes, give her charcoal. He says, you're going to do this for seven to eight hours. Increase by a quarter of a teaspoon every hour. So the first hour is a quarter of a teaspoon. Second hour is a half a teaspoon every 15 minutes. The third hour is three quarters of a teaspoon every 15 minutes, all the way up. He said, you will be tempted around three to four hours to say, she's doing so well, let's just get her to drink the stuff. Don't do it. She can't handle it. So on Tuesday, that's what we did. Tuesday night, we had her drinking juice. She, she, she'd gone all day. She'd done well. By the evening, we had her drinking some juice. This is on Tuesday. Friday, she was eating in the dining room with the rest of the patients. When she left, she was jogging on campus, and she's still alive today. Isn't that cool? God gave us just simple things. And I've tried it many times since, and it works well. And a few times, I thought, well, let me challenge Phil. That's what science does. You challenge, don't you? You test it. Boom. Three hours, four hours, they throw up. You've got to go that seven, eight hours, quarter of a teaspoon, uh, increasing by a quarter of a teaspoon each hour. What was the diagnosis originally? She had pancreatitis. Oh boy. So you put one teaspoon of charcoal and how much water did you 
a cup. Mm -hmm. And stir it and wait 15 minutes to make slurry and give her a quarter of a teaspoon. And I've never had it not work if I follow that recipe. I've tested it several times and just as Phil said, they will throw up if you try it at three or four hours. It's amazing. Any other questions? For hypothyroidism, yes. Hypothyroidism is a lot easier than hyperthyroidism. But hypothyroidism is I use, um, number one is no chlorine, no fluoride, and no bromide. Because those three can't, pardon? The heavy metals. They, can they, they, they can prevent the thyroid from absor absorbing iodine. The other is Dr. William Davis. Uh, he found that wheat is not good for thyroid, the American wheat, the 42 chromosomes. The things that we found to be beneficial, iodine, um, depending on where their, their uh, TSH is, uh, but uh, anywhere 12.5, 25, some even 50 milligrams a day. Most of them we start you know, around 25. If they're having problems absorbing, you can use B2 and B3, somewhere between uh, 250 to 500 uh, milligrams of B2, 500 to 1,000 milligrams of B3 a day. That will help the, uh, the thyroid to absorb iodine. Selenium, anywhere between 200 and 400 micrograms a day. Um, zinc, 30 to 50 milligrams a day, but if you're doing the zinc, be sure on the copper because zinc depletes copper. And then L-tyrosine, anywhere between 500 and 1,000 milligrams of L-tyrosine. I started using 500 milligrams of L-tyrosine, but I'm finding now using 1,000 milligrams of L-tyrosine, I'm having better results. Also the adrenals. Blown adrenals seem to affect, and so I use things like, did I bring it? Adrenosense, uh, which the Adrenosense has uh, rhodiola, suma, eleuthero, shishandra, and ashwagandha. Uh, also the nettle is good for the adrenals. Um, stress blows the adrenals, but I'm finding I, for many things, I've got to address those adrenals. So many people have blown adrenals. I'm finding benefit there. Also, there are some that are finding benefit by doing uh, poultices, by doing uh, charcoal, uh, castor oil pack, and bentonite clay where they'll put a charcoal poultice on, say, for a week, a bit not clay for a week, a castor oil pack for a week, and rotate those. For the... Um, um, the lab... Um, I'm trying to think. You got your, your, your TSH, your T3, T4, free T3, free T4, your... What's the other one I'm missing? The what? Okay, the one that's the, it's not a letter, it's a word. Oh, isn't that terrible when you can't remember? Anyway, I'm finding that juicing works really well. Doing a 60-day juice fast really stabilizes that lab. Isn't that terrible? I know. I just can't remember which one it is, but juicing works really well. I need some ginkgo. You're right. Drink some more water. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you all.